So basically, we've been here as a group for almost seven weeks now, every single day, 24 seven in front of Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's office here in the middle of Sydney, demanding a ceasefire, demanding that Australia reinstate the UNRWA funding, which they cut, demanding that we cease weapons trade with Israel and calling on the Prime Minister to meet with us. Now, we know that Australia joined with a number of other countries the day after the International Court of Justice found a plausible case for genocide that Israel was conducting in Gaza. The very next day, the Australian government and a number of other governments cut funding to UNRWA, the UN agency that facilitates the provision of the majority of humanitarian aid in Gaza. It is now been restored, but more than a month after that shameful decision was taken, well after places like Sweden, the EU, Canada had reinstated that, uh, reinstated that funding, why did Australia lag so far behind? And why did they make this decision in the first place? Well, we know that the only reason that they reversed it is because of what we've been doing here, because hundreds of people have been coming here day after day, every single hour around the clock, to send a message to the Prime Minister that his behaviour and the behaviour behavior of his government is unacceptable. And that's a win. So we are having, we are, we are, um, excuse me, we are making a difference here. We well, are, I heard that he's stopped coming here and his staff is now working from home because of this vigil. Well, you, right? I mean, yeah, but that's, that's sort of the point. They are too terrified I mean, this is supposed to be an office that you can walk into freely. It's the Prime Minister's own electorate. People who live in this area are supposed to be able to come to his office freely to raise their concerns, to get help with what they need, to make their views known. They've now barricaded themselves inside. The Prime Minister hasn't been seen in this part of the world for a very long time. He's hiding from us. He's hiding from us because he's ashamed. He knows what he's doing is wrong. He knows that the decisions of his government are absolutely beholden to the interests of the US at and above the interests of this own, our own country. Oh, is he bought? Does the US have him over a barrel? Do they have info on him? How does this stuff work? If he's ashamed and he knows what he's doing I think this is an ongoing problem with successive Australian governments going back years and years and years. It ties into things like AUKUS, it ties into our military relationship with the US, the way that Australia positions itself as a middle power whose only survival in the region is really with um, the US sort of shielding it from particularly China. This is a, an odd world view that creates us a situation where we have tension not only with our neighbours in the Asia Pacific, in the, in the region in which we are in, but it also means that when it comes to these, uh, these matters of foreign diplomacy, we are consistently on the side of American military adventurism. It cannot be allowed to continue. We need the government and the Prime Minister to understand that the majority of people in this country do not support the genocide in Gaza, do not support Israel's war of aggression, and it's time for him to listen to the people. Otherwise, he's not going to be in that office for very much longer. He's going to be voted out. Two more questions. I'll make them quick. The first is, I know there are Palestinians in Australia. Are there Palestinians who come to this vigil? And are there people who have fled Gaza in recent weeks or months? Yeah, absolutely. The, the makeup of this picket is incredibly diverse. You've got Palestinians, people who've lived here for years, people who are Australian citizens who are Palestinian. You've also got people who have fled Gaza and you know there's a couple of hundred of them who've, who've arrived in the recent months. We've, we've had some of them join us here as well. But we've also had a very broad cross-section of the community. We've had people from all backgrounds, all faiths. We've had people from the LGBT community. We've had people from, you know, we've had women and queer people and people of color, our, our indigenous brothers and sisters as well. We've had people from all across the spectrum coming together to say, this is not a question of, you know, Islam or Judaism, this is not a question of Arab or Jewish, this is a question of humanity. You cannot bomb two million people into extermination. It needs to stop. And that is why so many people are here 
from every walk of life. The sign up there in front that says Albanese, Marrickville office, that's got a, a little sticker on there, in black and white of a little girl wearing, a little girl of five wearing a graduation cap. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about him, Rajab, briefly? Um, I mean, I don't know what to say. There are... <laughs> we printed an enormous banner. A massive banner. It was, it was probably about three, three meters long. Uh, with the names of children who've been killed by Israel in Gaza. And, uh, you know, naming them all with their ages. And the banner, despite how big it was, was not even half of the names of children who have been killed. When you, when you see kids like Hind, kids who have been buried under the rubble, who in their desperate final moments are trying to call emergency responders, you know, trapped under the rubble or trapped in a car with the, the decomposing corpses of their, their parents, of their loved ones, unsure whether they will be rescued using their final moments imagine a five-year-old on the phone you know with 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 triple zero or you know the paramedics be begging for help in this country we'd find it horrifying if a child was put in that position and child trapped under the rubble doing the same thing and unfortunately she didn't live she was killed Allah Hi. Hey. 